This is going to land in an unusual place. We're very welcome to this chat, beautiful community. I want to review just between us um, the online debate about whether the real Putin or the Putin double went to Mariupol. And what I want to get out of that conversation is something about our epistemic response to the world around us. It goes to the heart of how we engage in conflict and politics. So this is going to be nothing to do with Mariupol's you know, uh, uh, devastation or the Russian tyrant's visit to Mariupol or even the Russia-Ukrainian war, except in the sense that it is about that because it is about how we engage with people who are fellow citizens in our country, wherever you live in the world. Often there are folks we meet online, right? How do we engage in a way that avoids the many epistemic mistakes we've got to avoid? But in this little chat, we'll focus on just one important epistemic mistake. That's quite easy to articulate, actually. That's why we'll keep this relatively brief. Mm. I don't want to talk to us about um, whether that was Putin or not. You kind of know my, my recommendation. Um, I don't want to get into this sort of basic epistemic um, banalities about you know, the fact that to, to judge whether that's a, the real tyrant or the fake tyrant in Mariupol, um, or whether that's even Mariupol, um, that to do that, you can't just compare photographs. You actually have to have some um, a almost embodied knowledge of that person. And that's why people who sort of woke up to this news story about Russia and Ukraine in February 2022, um, who don't know Putin's speech, don't know Putin's body language, don't know Putin's communication style. Um, they're just comparing pictures and seeing, um, you know, w w what looks to them like Putin or not Putin. But the truth is, um, that there are also people who have been following Putin for, you know, 25, 30 years, and they have a, a somewhat internalized sense of his physicality, and that's incomparably a superior indicator than just comparing still photographs. But that's all stuff we're not going to talk about, right? What we are going to talk about is something very curious that came out of this and had a bit of universality to it. And that's that it felt like to a lot of people, whatever view you took of this, that the majority voice, um, or at least the single biggest voice, was the voice of people who thought it was obviously a double, obviously not the real Putin. And I began to think about this just, you know, in the last few hours when I scanned social media platforms where this was being debated and people who thought that it was definitely Putin's double and people who thought that it was definitely Putin himself and everybody in the middle all too often converged you know they took a different view of this on the same conclusion about which voice was the most preponderant and which position was the most popular and there was a kind of feeling that that's obviously a double, is a rather dominant position. So we ran a survey on the second channel, on the chat channel here, about what you guys thought. And the results are interesting in the way that it'll make this really important epistemic point for us. It goes to the heart of key political questions including whether your damn democracy is going to survive. Um, so I said, who was that, that in Mariupol? And I gave five options. Putin's double, obviously. Putin's double, probably. The real Putin, obviously. The real Putin, probably. And not sure. So... Not sure, um, so far there's like four or five thousand votes, um, and um, not sure is 14%. Putin's double, obviously, is 
Putin's double probably is 23%. The real Putin obviously is 9%. And the real Putin probably is 38%. So the number of people who thought that was obviously a double is 16%. So way lower than um, was my impression of a lot of people's impression of how that balance was. Interestingly, um, if you combine the people who say it was the real Putin, obviously or probably, you get 47%. And if you combine people who say it was the double, obviously or probably, you get 39%. So people in this poll are siding toward it being the real Putin. But here's what's interesting, um, that of the people who say it's real, um, only a small relatively small number says that it's obviously the real Putin. So only 9% think it's obviously the real Putin, whereas 16% think it's obviously a double. Some interesting observations to be made about that. I'll let you deduce those. Um, but then 23% think it's probably the double and 38% think it's probably the real one. So what do we take away from this? This is really, really important. This is not um, trivial. And this is not one of those TEDx talks where you get some kind of interesting curiosity you discover about this or that part of the world that is endlessly fascinating, but doesn't go to the core of sort of real three-dimensional societal political challenges we're facing right now. Um, One of the things that I always talk about is to accept that you've got to share the table of politics with citizens in your democracy, if you live in a democracy, whether you like them or not. Right? And there are some extreme conditions under which you can really no longer go on sharing that table if they're threatening violence, for example. But mostly you've got to recognize that they're real, that your fellow citizens are real. And even if you despise their worldview, or despise what you perceive as their irrationality, you're sharing that table of politics with them and you can't pretend they aren't there. Because if you pretend they aren't there, in your mind you might be creating your own perfect uncompromised table of politics. But in reality you'll just be sitting there alone as the politics around you happens. And so where am I driving with this? A part of handling this business of the table of politics and the fact that it has to be shared with others through difficulty and that it requires toleration. And toleration is a negative thing. You tolerate things you don't like. Um, now, what I'm driving with this is that we are chronically bad at estimating actually how many um, voices of each kind there are at our table of politics. And that leads to extremely perverse and unconstructive political action. Because we might be responding to a political momentum of, let us say, 11% of the population as though that were not 11%, but 41. Yeah. And we make this mistake both down and up. And it's not a mistake produced by sort of sloppy logic or sloppy thinking and not going about it the right way. It's a mistake produced by the delimitedness of our perspective as we engage in conflict from inside about what the actual balance of power, or balance of numbers in that conflict is. So let's take a few concrete examples here, because what makes this so important is that it's not just a mistake that you and I might make as individuals, it's a mistake institutions ongoingly and regularly make. So let's take some um, Media institutions as an example. 
For instance, even though they're very different institutions, you might take the BBC in the UK or the New York Times in the United States. There is a difference because, because the New York Times is no longer trying to speak to all Americans. The BBC still is trying to speak to all Brits. Um, now, let's imagine um, it both ways, um, an overestimation and an underestimation of some. So let's start with um, um, underestimation. Imagine that um, this institution is running a particularly progressivist message, right? Um, and it's a message that is deeply colored by a lot of the uh, currently active social justice projects in the Western world. And that's why I'm putting it so abstractly, because I want you to be neutral about this, because this is not the point, right? Um, where you stand on this or that social justice project, whether you are the, the most um, sort of involved activist or whether you, you're an opponent. Um, but imagine that these are um, all social justice projects to do with um, rectifying long-standing historical disadvantage and injustice and discrimination, deprioritization, exclusion, and so on. What might happen is that that institution might dramatically underestimate how much of the general population are actually not on board with these projects. And why could that happen? It could happen because some of the leading newspapers, most of the universities, much of the discourse in the social media forums that are around normalize something that might in fact have only persuaded a section of the population it could be even some kind of elite or some kind of educated elite or some kind of urban elite or whatever but it could have persuaded only a, a, a fraction of the population but that institution let's say the bbc might go on as though actually 80% of the population are persuaded and it's only 12 that are sort of not quite there, not quite behind, maybe because they're irrational or maybe because they're backward or maybe because they don't, don't see things that way, but they're a minority anyway. But it might be that they're not. And then the problem isn't whether these social justice projects are right or wrong, constructive or unconstructive. The problem is you're assuming that an act of persuasion has happened that hasn't happened. You are relating to, um, let us say, you know, um, a population as though 80% of them believe something, whereas in fact only 20% of them might believe it. And so there is this very big gap of 60. And this is why it's so important to be neutral, because you've got to frame this point. Whether you think that what you've got to persuade them of is absolutely right, or whether you think that it's actually wrong, the point is they're just not persuaded of it, or not persuaded of it yet, or not persuaded of it, period. You, you clearly, irredeemably unpersuaded. Right? Um, <clears throat> it's so toxic to broadcast to the country and pretend that the 20% represents the 80% when it doesn't. Let's take it the other way around. So, uh, you know, I, I took an example of uh, social justice progressivism. Let's take an example the other side. Let's take an example from the, um, let us say, the populist right that might sometimes veer on the anti-democratic, if you like, um, by wanting to smash establishment institutions, but also perhaps smash the checks and balances. <clears throat> Well, now, imagine you're the same institution, let's say, picked on the BBC, but could be anything else. But let's stay with that example. Let's say you release a video about something. And let's say it is a video, again, that, that, that um, rather represents a kind of uh, progressive consensus that might overestimate the real 
depth of that consensus in reality. And then the comments begin coming in, and they're all negative. And they all say that, in fact, this institution, the BBC, is somehow now only on the side of some people in society, but not others. And that somehow there is some kind of establishment. And sometimes there's, and, and also there is some kind of a, you know, globalist something. And somehow things are happening here and there and this and that and this and that and this and blah, blah, blah. And we're all excluded from it. But this is happening. This is an elite and they're bad. They're betraying us. They're working against us. And all of the institutions are corrupt and evil and horrible and so on. And imagine you get a comment like that. And then 12. And then 7,000. And imagine then you get a thousand comments which say, oh, yeah, the BBC is great. But the 7,000 say just trust all institutions. And you are a corrupt institution to you, whoever, you know, you are this BBC thing that is pumping stuff into me, making me pay for it, uh, but also sharing it, this stuff online. I don't like you. And there's 7,000 of me below. And so what very typically happens with institutions that are scared about um, the kind of shifting tides of current culture wars is that they dramatically over-exaggerate what um, that 7,000 means. And they conclude from the fact that, you know, seven out of eight people have disliked their video, that that is a kind of majority. And therefore they feel they're sort of assailed by certain cultural forces. And what that might then might happen is that just like, like in the first example, they might overindulge certain progressivist project, projects. So in this example, they might overindulge certain um, exclusionary, anti-democratic, populist, right political projects. And let me be absolutely clear here, being right-wing is normatively impeccable as far as democracy is concerned. So we're not talking about being right-wing talking about a special pathology on the right, right, that involves some people who are on the right, but not others. Now, what happens is that you say, okay, well, that 7,000 probably represents like half of the population. So we've got to sort of slow down here and maybe take some defensive steps. Because it looks like we're just surrounded and assailed. So maybe now, the next 25 times, um, a populist anti-democratic politician who is uh, anti-establishment in that particular way, next time they flagrantly lie, we kind of normalize that. And I'm not saying that happens at the level of a committee meeting where that's decided, but I'm saying that there is that kind of pressure, that kind of pull that might cause that kind of uh, reaction from that institution. Um, but the truth might be that that 7,000 represents not, not half of the population, but 25% only, a distinct minority. And it's different. Uh, politics is tough. You can't just tell citizens to go away if they're real and they're numerous, right? But there is a difference. You could say, okay, 25% is bad, but, you know, that is a minority. That means that for one of them, there is three others. This is a social challenge. We've got to work. We've got to respect that these people as well in that 25%. They're real and we can't just dismiss them as sort of irrational or as moral idiots, that would be a moral disgrace. They are also citizens who are trying to live in this society. They're doing their best. But this is absolutely, there's this absolutely catastrophic defensive play from major, stick to my example, journalistic institutions, which is based on seeing a tsunami coming your way and thinking that it's a seven meter tsunami when it's a one meter tsunami which is serious and bad but there is this vast difference and so that kind of overestimation is of the essence of you know politics it's not just some kind of a you know 
a simple mistake about percentages. It goes to the heart of how we negotiate a society together and how we do conflict, right? That we shouldn't dramatically overestimate or dramatically underestimate the numbers of citizens who are in some kind of um, significant position, right, in society. And so uh, that's really, really important. And that little tendency came out in this trivial micro issue whether the Russian tyrant has a double that went for him to Mariupol. Um, and you know what my recommendation to think about that is, but that's not the point. Um, the point is that here, really, a 14% was experienced, at least by some people I've come, I'd come across online, as being at 50 and that means that the people who, th who, who thought that that was obviously a double thought that the number of people who thought that that was obviously a double was quite high, and it isn't, or at least it's not in this community. But also people who thought it really didn't look like a double at all agreed and said, yeah, that, but the, the numbers you know, are, are indeed high for those who think it was a double. And so whichever, whichever side you took, you were at risk of a misconception there about these numbers. And that misconception matters a lot, a lot. Even in this trivial little debate about whether the, the, you know, the character you saw there was the real thing or not, it, it matters whether it's 14% or 54%, because that does change how you engage in discourse. That does change how you visualize the um, you know, discursive space around you. And this is a mistake that not just humans make, but institutions make. And it's a terribly dangerous mistake, especially when you're going around confusing a 20% with an 80%. One way, by thinking there is many more of a certain uh, 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 cat category than there really is, or whether you think it the other way, whether there is in fact an 80, uh, uh, but you confuse the 80 with a 20. So I may have got myself mixed up by now. But you, 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 you get what I'm trying to say. And the reason I've been going in circles is because there is a real political importance to, be, to not be at like 60 when something is at 20. If something is 20 and you're 30, that's fine. But we often have these real epistemic crises of radical miscalculation here, radical misestimation that's produced not by error, but uh, by our involvedness in certain projects, you know, uh, we can sometimes think that 80% of the people are really on our side when the majority of aren't, right? Um, or we can also get scared and think that um, certain folks that we are in, in sort of uh, rapidly deteriorating disagreement with, that they are much more numerous than they really are. But getting the numbers right is damn important, right? For democracy to sustain itself. Thank you very much for it, attending this um, rant. Lots of love, Toxin.